Well, good morning and welcome to the Public Petitions Committee. And uh, could I ask everyone to switch off their mobile phones and electronic devices as they do interfere with the sound system? Uh, no apologies have been received, so we'll move on to Agenda Item 1, which is consideration of current petitions. There are four current petitions. The first is PE1105 by Major McCann, Son St. Margaret of Scotland Hospice. Members have a note by the clerk. Can I invite contributions from members and what action they wish to take in this petition? David? Um, convener, can I ask that this uh, petition be deferred to allow the petitioner and Gil Patterson MSP a chance to speak at a future meeting of the committee? Mm. Uh, convener, yes, I have a Content for uh, uh, the petition to be deferred for Gil Patterson to be present when we next consider it. Uh, and I'm not so sure I would necessarily be in inviting others to contribute, but I would certainly be happy to receive any further submission uh, that would, would, they might wish to make uh, before we decide what the best course of action would be going forward. Members agree to that action? Thank you. The next petition is PE1500 by Stuart Husden, OBE, on behalf of RSPB Scotland on the Golden Eagle as the National Bird of Scotland. Members have a note by the clerk, and can I invite contribution from members as to what action uh, we take on this petition. Jackson. Um, convener, for me this has been one of the most preposterous petitions that I have had to consider in a number of years. We have been trying to breathe life into this dead bird of a petition for quite some time. Um, I think the Scottish Government's position has been quite clear on the matter. They don't uh, they are not persuaded by a legislative route through Parliament, and therefore I would um, move that we close the petition, although I'm quite happy for the RSPB, insofar as they wish to do so, to continue to establish public opinion with regard to this, uh, and perhaps at some other date persuade the Government and others of the need to advance a petition for Scotland to adopt a national bird. I'm happy to agree with that. David? Uh, Convener, I'm happy to agree with that and let the RSPB go out and do a consultation and come back to us. Angus? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I'm certainly uh, happy to close the petition. Uh, I, think it's, um, I think the onus is on the RSPB to prove their case, uh, so I'm in full agreement that it should be the RSPB who undertake or arrange uh, the, the public consultation, um, particularly given uh, the financial constraints everybody's under just now in the RSPB. I'm led to believe we're not short of a penny or two. And Zala? It's not about finances, but I think it, it's certainly about what the, what the current government position is, and I think the fact that they've made their position very clear, I think it's important that a consultation is allowed to take place, and if they wish to, they can always come back to us uh, after a year once they've had their findings to, to, to establish a greater support for what they've shown so far. So far. So, members agreed to close the petition? Okay, agreed. The next petition is PE1539 by Anne Booth on Housing Associations and the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2006. Members have a note by, a note by the clerk and the submissions. And uh, after papers were issued, an email received from the petitioner. So, may I invite contributions from members as to what action the committee should take on this petition now? John. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I would propose that we keep this petition open and in doing so that we write to the Scottish Government to seek their views on the special report that was laid before the Ministers from the Scottish Information Commissioner uh, who has clearly indicated in the submission that they are supportive of the uh, concept of housing associations coming under, or the registered social landlords coming under the freedom of information legislation. Uh, in writing to the Scottish Government, I would seek their views on the Information <laughs> Commissioner's uh, report, uh, which commissioners have the right to lay down special reports, and I think the Information Commissioner uh, made their views known on this issue, and it would be interesting to find out what the Scottish Government and how the Scottish Government will respond uh, to the report laid down by the Information Commissioner. Uh, it would also be useful, Convener, uh, at the same time as we're writing to the Scottish Government, to ask the Scottish Housing Regulator's uh, view on the issue of FOI 
uh, inclusion for housing associations and others uh, at the present time uh, so that we can actually get a rounded picture in relation to how we take this petition forward. Kenny? I mean, I, I'm not the first to write in there, but it does seem to me to some extent the, uh, the purpose of the petition has been you know, achieved. I think what we have to do is to get some assurance from the government about where they're going. It does seem to me that further changes in FOI, which I think we all accept are going to happen, should be done uh, probably, you know, uh, contemporaneously rather than piecemeal. Uh, I think it would be important to make it clear to the government that there appears to be clear, you know, support for this. Uh, but the next stage for further FOI shouldn't be a bit to do with RSLs and a bit on something else. It should be to move forward across the board, widening and deepening the organisations that are uh, FYable. David. Convener, thank you. I'm quite happy to close this uh, petition as well, considering that the Scottish Government will uh, shortly go out to consultation for us, so um, I'm happy to back. I would agree there's no point in duplication. I think the fact that the government is going to, to carry one out anyway, I think that would probably be hand in glove in terms of this petition. So I'm quite happy for it to be closed as well. So are the committee in agreements that we should close this petition? Could perhaps the committee agree that we maybe go forward with joint suggestion and then we could bring it back at a later date uh, with a view of maybe uh, closing? Angus? Yes, I think that's the way forward. Um, it would be good to hear uh, from the Scottish Housing Regulator before uh, the petition is closed. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the way forward. I'd be happy to, to uh, second John's, John Wilson's recommendation. Jackson? I'm agnostic, I think, on the way forward, but if a colleague has a particularly strong view, uh, then I'm quite happy in the circumstances to allow that to uh, dictate the way forward on this occasion. Okay, then. Agreed? Thank you. The fourth and final current petition today is PE 1482 by John Wormsley on uh, isolation of single rooms in hospitals. Members have a note by the clerk and a submission from the Scottish Government. Can I invite contributions from members and what action to take on the petition? Comments, colleagues? David? Um, I'm quite happy to defer the petition, um, convener, to allow the Scottish Government time to publish its review and consider its findings. And we could continue from there. Jackson? Yeah, it's not clear that the Scottish Government, from the letter from Mr Browning, had in fact detailed any timetable for any review that they might initiate. Um, I know that the Scottish Government is going to undertake uh, research. They're very strong in detailing their uh, presumption rather than it being a no obligation choice. I, I'm, I'm not sure that this petition hasn't now brought the issue to, the, to our consideration for debate. We've kept it open for quite some time. Um, it seems to me from the letter we've received that the issue is something that is now going to be part of an ongoing review. I, I'm not therefore sure what more the petition or this committee would achieve. So I, I'm not, I mean, I, I'd be happy to see it close if that's not what colleagues want to do, fine, but I'm not quite sure when it specifically we would expect to have any evidence. And I imagine if the evidence was compelling in a particular direction, the Scottish Government would then take account of it. So in a sense, the ambition of the petition has already been fulfilled. Yeah. 
I think probably, you know, having read the report, I've noticed that a, pre a, a preliminary copy of the review and the Scottish Government is now, seen expert, uh, are now seeking expert views on that, right? And uh, we will, of course, write in due course once again, we've obtained that expert opinion on its findings and reassess the Scottish Government policy in the light of this evidence. So, Where could we... That, that was in the Scottish Government letter dated 18th of February. Yeah, but, but my... Sorry, my understanding is that review confirms that they've had nothing to do with the impact of single rooms. It then goes on in paragraph four to say, in, the lack of the la in light of the lack of research on this issue, we recognise it will be important to gather evidence from our own facilities to measure the impact of single rooms and consider any implications for our current policy, and we will take steps to address this through ongoing surveys as well as formal post-occupancy analysis. So there is nothing in the review which... The, gov the government have already looked at that and they've already concluded that there is nothing in the review which is going to illuminate us any further on the issue of single rooms. The only way that's going to happen is through further analysis, which they're saying they will undertake, but not to any specific timetable, as mm -hmm. far as I can see. Uh, John. Thank you, Convener. In the start of paragraph two in the letter we received on the 18th February, the, basically the, the letter outlines... They've co attached a copy, the preliminary copy of the review, and they're seeking expert views. And while Jackson Carlow is right, there is no timetable attached to this correspondence that we could write to the Scottish Government and ask them what the timetable was to seek those expert views, and we can consider that at a later date once the Scottish Government respond. Because I think that it's quite clear there is still some ongoing work being done by the Scottish Government on this issue, and I think it would be wrong for us at this time to close the petition until we get further information from the Scottish Government as to how they intend to carry out the, the review and the timescale for that review. Uh, and I think once we get that information, we could move forward in closing the petition. Anzala? Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with those sentiments. I think it's important uh, for two uh, aspects. One, from the petitioner's point of view as well, that they're obviously wanting to see a conclusion, and that would be helpful, and that's the whole point of bringing a petition to this committee in the first instance. And the second, it will perhaps allow the government to focus more clearly in terms of a timetable scale. I think that's important as well. So uh, I think it's important to actually keep it open at this stage to allow that to happen. But I think we need to press the government to try and come up with some sort of time scale because I think it's important to show the, 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 the petitioners that work is actually being done and there is, there is, a, there is an end to the tunnel at some stage. <laughs> Thanks, Convener. Yeah, I, I agree that we should um, give the Scottish Government time to, to publish their view, but certainly uh, contact them to find out what the timetable would be. Members agree with that approach? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. I now move on to agenda item two is, is consideration of new petitions. We have three new petitions, and the committee agreed to hear from the petitioners on all three. The first new petition is PE1553 by Councillor Andra S. Wood on rendering industry regulations. And members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing and the petition. And may I welcome Councillor Wood to the meeting. I also welcome Dr. Sue McLeod and from Enviro Source Limited and Norman Watt from Bindas Chemical Company. Uh, I will now invite Councillor Wood to speak uh, for around five minutes, and I do believe that you want to share par perhaps some of your presentation with Dr. McLeod. Yes. So I'll hand it over to you, and then we'll move to questions. Thank you. B before I start, though, I would like to first open up by applauding the Petitions Committee for the most recent workshop that they held within Dumfries about a couple of months ago. And an excellent experience and gave local people the opportunity to engage in your whole system and process. What I would ask, though, is for the Petitions Committee to give consideration to rolling it out to our senior schools because young people are now engaging far more in politics. And it's, as you'll see from the audience, they are engaging. We have a lot of young people here today. So if you could take that on board, I would really welcome that as an elected member from Dumfries Council. Anyway, to move on with the petition, 
I would like to thank the uh, convener and his committee for giving consideration to having the petition heard on rend rendering regulations and the differentials within an interpretation and governance thereafter between north and south of the border. Please be assured that this is not about seeking to have standards within Scotland or anywhere else for that matter lowered. This is about the financial burdens and the, within a very competitive market. This is very much about finding and ensuring existing legislation is both equitable and sustainable within a set of regulations that now apply for all operators within the UK while ensuring security of the Scottish rendering industry for the long term and future. Now, as a farmer, I recognise the national importance of rendering industry and have endured foot and mouth on two occasions. There has been avian flu and anthrax, and it is very important that we retain the national rendering industry from a biosecurity perspective. But anyway, that is enough from myself. This is very complex, and I am very, very keen that we get as much teased out here today as possible. So I would like to now bring in Dr. McLeod, if that is agreeable. Thank you. <clears throat> I am going to set the scene a wee bit about what rendering is and the uh, regulatory background that has caused the issue that we are bringing to you today. Rendering is a very important part of the recycling industry in Scotland and in England, supplying tallow for the production of biodiesel and meal for pet food manufacture. And as Andrew has already said, it's, over the years it's played an important role in biosecurity, for example, in the BSE and foot and mouth crises. It's a cooking process. Um, it's essentially um, liquid is driven off and produces a highly odorous gas as part of that process. And it's really this vapour that causes rendering to come under environmental scrutiny. Since the mid-2000s, um, all rendering plants in the UK have been regulated under the Pollution Prevention and Control Regime, PPC, which is transposed from Europe into Scottish and English law. To understand our concerns, you need to understand the fundamental philosophy of PPC and understand how it was transposed in England compared to Scotland. So PPC, at the core of it, uh, the the requirement that environmental issues should be addressed in an integrated way across all media, so that's soil, air and water. And it requires that an installation uses <coughs> best available techniques to achieve this, so BAT. Europe provided guidance on BAT for different processes in the form of BAT reference documents um, but it was left up to member states to decide how to implement this guidance in their own permits. And for rendering, the implementation has been different over the years in Scotland compared to England. In Scotland, we have a single regulator, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, SEPA, who regulates all rendering plants. In England, a rendering plant is regulated usually by a local authority, so except for an accident of geography, each site will have a different regulator. So you can argue that uh, Scottish regulation is, is a lot more consistent. In Scotland, a rendering plant is not, particularly, um, it's not a particularly complex process in the spectrum of SEPA's uh, regulatory responsibilities. Whereas in England, a rendering plant is often a local authority's most complex plant, amongst much simpler setups such as petrol stations and dry cleaners. In Scotland, SEPA applies a risk-based approach to its definition of BAT, best available technology, whereas in England, local authorities use DEFRA guidance in the form of the rendering sector guidance note, a document that SEPA gives cognizance to but has not adopted as guidance. In our experience, these things mean that PPC permits in Scotland are more robust than their English counterparts, the compliance bar is higher, and regulator scrutiny more detailed. And because of the way BAT is applied, there are circumstances where a compliant English plant would not be compliant in Scotland. These differences mean that compliance costs more in Scotland and we've produced a document that highlights some of these costs 
including a significant difference in permitting scheme charges between SEPA and the English local authority. And it was this document that formed the basis of the um, petition. We're concerned that a nationwide industry should be treated so differently in England compared to Scotland. But we believe that recent changes in environmental legislation provide an opportunity to narrow this gap. Uh, these changes are the European Industrial Emissions Directive, which has recently been transposed into English and Scottish law. An important part of this um, is that the European BAT reference documents, those documents giving guidance on best available techniques, are going to be reviewed for each sector, updated and summarised into a set of conclusions and emission limits, which member states must then use as a basis for setting and revising permit conditions. Work in the rendering sector is in the early stages at the moment and is expected to be completed by 2018. We would like Scottish Government to ensure that at the end of this process, SEPA and DEFRA, who provide guidance to the local authorities, agree on the same definition of BAT for the rendering industry in the UK and that the same emission limit values apply in England and in Scotland, so levelling the uh, currently unlevel playing field. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Angus? Yes, thanks. Mr. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, you, you present a good case. Um, can I ask, is there a, a local dimension to this? Is there a, a renderer within Dumfries and Galloway? Yes, uh, the local renderer is Dundas Chemical Company. We have uh, an operation here in Dumfries and also an operation in uh, Motherwell uh, near Glasgow. Okay. And are there any other operators in Scotland, just these two? There is only one other site which is not operational at the moment, and that's uh, in Contour near Aberdeen. Okay. Um, given um, from the evidence that you've given just now that the uh, compliance bar is, is higher in Scotland uh, than in England, um, are the prices paid in Scotland lower than in England um, due to the, the, the stricter, stricter environmental re regulation? It's not possible to, uh, when facing a, a, a meat plant, to negotiate price. It's not possible to use that as any kind of leverage at all. They're interested in the best price, and uh, they're, they're similar prices. No difference. Okay. I'm, I'm just thinking about hides and skins, for example. Yep. Um, you know, presumably there's a, a higher price paid in, in England than in Scotland. Not particularly. It uh, it will depend entirely on logistical costs. Uh, and it won't, uh, the, the influence of legislation will not have an effect on that. Okay. Thanks. Could, could I, just before uh, uh, take any further questions, it's important to understand uh, when we talk about the rendering industry here, we're talking uh, in, in terms of our petition to do with the red meat rendering industry. There are other two, two sectors, uh, which is the rendering of fish and the rendering of poultry, and these are not included in, in the dialogue today. Okay. Thanks. Jackson. So it's an education for me listening to all of this because it's not a subject about which, uh, I am f uh, with which I'm familiar. Um, what I wasn't clear entirely, and I think perhaps uh, Dr. McLeod was trying to take me there, but I wasn't clear from the petition what remedy it is that you are urging be followed to achieve the result of your petition. So I, I wasn't clear what you were I understand what you would like, but how would you see a process towards that being achieved? I think that's what I'd quite like to understand. Um, as Dr McLeod highlighted, um, currently there's a change coming in terms of legislation. At this point in time, we as an industry feel in Scotland that we are disadvantaged against the English, English operators. Um, in order to achieve a level playing field, it's very difficult to, to do that mid-legislation. So because of this change coming around, there's an opportunity here to do something about it. And what we'd like to do is to use the resources of the Scottish Government to influence uh, these, these up-and-coming discussions, which will principally be between, be between SEPA and DEFRA and the European right. legislators. So which parliament is it that is initiating a change in legislation? The European so it, it, yes. it's through the European yes. Parliament that a change yes. of legislation is forthcoming. Yeah. And in the context of that change of legislation, you would like to see this issue brought to the fore there. Absolutely. And yeah. so in that sense, you're asking this committee 
to urge the Scottish Government to be proactive in that process? Absolutely. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Then. Yeah, sorry, convener. John. Thank you. Good morning. It's just to try and expand <coughs> some of the differences that exist. You've made reference to local authorities uh, in England and Wales and the regulatory regime that they apply under uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and you've referred to SEPA's regulations. What is the real impact of the differences that the, in how the regulations are applied? Because, it's, as I understand it, it's the same regulations that are supposed to apply throughout Europe. No? The regulations are different? In principle, but that's not the case in practice. Could you expand on that? So just so we get an idea of what, what the issues are and why you feel the rendering industry in Scotland is being more disadvantaged than the rest of either the UK or the rest of Europe. I think a lot comes down to the regulator at the end of the day. Um, SEPA regulates all industry on an environmental perspective in Scotland, and there is a consistency. Um, there is a, a, a level of um, expertise that you wouldn't get in a, an environmental, um, protect, environmental health department of a local authority. So it really does come down to um, the regulator at the end of the day and the resources that are available to a regulator, I think. Um, I, I steered away from some of the, um, the detail of, of what happens, but in, the, in, the, um, in England, the Environment Agency, which is uh, SEPA's counterpart in England, will regulate those industries that uh, are perceived to have the biggest cross-media impact and rendering, um, we have part A and part B processes um, in Scotland. In England, they have um, a part A1 and a part A2, which would be the equivalent of our part A processes, and then part B processes. All part B processes, things like your petrol stations and your dry cleaners, um, come under local authority regulation. And A2 processes also sit there, and that's where rendering sits in England as an A2 process. So though it does have cross-media impact, um, it's perceived to have less than, uh, than some of its counterparts within the A group. And so it sits with the local authority, and local authorities tend not to have the same resources. So the whole application process in Scotland is based around a risk process for that individual plant, whereas in England um, a permit is based more or less on uh, the DEFRA guidance with the um, the sector um, guidance note that DEFRA has produced. Convener, I appreciate Dr McLeod's response, but what I was trying to try and draw out as well is the issue about this is European Commission regulation regarding rendering plants. And it's while we talk about, and you've made reference to the difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK, it would be useful to find out whether or not you're aware of the differences that may exist in the rest of Europe. Because this, the European Commission make regulation not just for the UK, they make regulation for Europe, and it's how it's being applied in other parts of Europe, and whether or not we could actually use examples of how the regulations are applied in other countries within Europe that could then influence how we look at the regulations that are applied by SEPA in Scotland and how that affects the industry in Scotland. I think the issue uh, for the UK rendering industry in itself isn't so significant in relation to other member states and how it's interpreted. The, the primary problem we have is that the way the same piece of uh, legislation at European level is interpreted down through the member states. Uh, there is an interpretation in, in the UK terms, and as uh, Dr McLeod highlighted, uh, there is a, a, what's known as a breath note, which is the, effectively the guidance to be able to, to, to interpret that. The Scottish Environmental Protection Agency interprets it at a higher level than does uh, the local authorities in England who are using DEFRA guidance notes. Um, SEPA are aware of DEFRA's guidance notes, but don't use these in any form of uh, uh, um, um, legislative control on Scottish rendering plans. So there are real, real, real differences, and they come down to uh, operational costs in terms of monitoring of emissions, uh, acceptance levels, potential uh, legal action can be taken uh, in the Scottish uh, context, which would not be the same in England. Uh, and therefore, it's possible for operators to draw material out of Scotland 
for processing because it's easier to process that material in England than it is in Scotland. And that's the issue for the Scottish training industry. If that continues, then what will happen is that effectively Scotland will be disadvantaged and that product will move south of the border because it's easier to be processed there. And that's the, the hub behind this. Thank Mr Watt for his explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would it be possible to advise the committee? I know you've been in dialogue with uh, Alan Smith, M MEP, and who said obviously this is an unfair issue. Uh, can we have an update as to what he said uh, recently? At, at present, no. I'm still uh, awaiting a response from him, an actual fact, and it's all down to my, my fault for not uh, continuing the communication as I should have. So, yes, we, the, I will seek a follow up from that. But what we would like, I think, and it was asked earlier, and that is you know, what we want from the committee, and that is open working partnership so that we can give you the information because there's an awful lot of behind the scenes work has been taking place that I feel that as a committee you should get an overview of. And I think it would be extremely helpful, especially with what's taking place at present with legislation changing you know, as we speak. Jackson? I'm actually now slightly confused. Um, I thought I saw a clear course of action initially, but I, I'm afraid uh, Mr. Watt's explanation has now thrown me back uh, because it seems it's nothing to do with the European Union. It's all now to do with the agency or organisation within the United Kingdom that has been appointed to apply the regulations. Presumably the Scottish Government asked SEPA to be the... Uh, the, 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 the the regulator in, in Scotland? Yes. Um, so I'm not quite sure, therefore, through how European legislation um, that position would be remedied. Uh, I mean, in a, in a way, you're, you're, op, you're almost uncomfortable within the, the UK context, which you've now set apart from the rest of the European Union, yes. with the fact that the advice through the regula appointed regulator in England um, as to how the regulation should be applied is different uh, to the one in Scotland mm. and, and I, I can't quite see how you would remedy that now through the European Union because that's now really a matter for the Scottish Government to determine whether or not they think a convincing enough case has been made by the argument that you present to request SEPA to look again at the way in which they choose to um, enforce the regulation. Apologies, apologies if I've confused things, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll maybe try to answer your point here. Uh, the, the issue regarding the European Union is that over the next two to three years, there is going to be a change in how the legislation is updated. Uh, we're, we're living with the current set of circumstances from the European Union and the current interpretation, which is to the disadvantage of Scotland. Uh, our intention and behind our petition is to, is to seek help that during this review of the, the legislation, which is going to happen over the next three years, that your influence could be brought to bear through SEPA and DEFRA in the UK to bring everything back onto a level playing field. Does that help? Well, <laughs> sort of, I suppose. Okay. I think i would have to hear various, get some, get some help at all, I think, with uh, some of the submissions we might receive. Can I also... Hands on, I think I understand your concern. Uh, however, what even I am failing to understand or grasp is the actual difference. What is it that is actually going to uh, be that is going to disadvantage us in Scotland with the, 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 the legislation? And also, um, you are concerned about SEPA and uh, what is it that SEPA hopes, <coughs> intends to do, what you feel they are intending to do, that are going to disadvantage you. If you could just focus into, into that okay, okay. in itself would be helpful. If I take the first point, our, our concerns are, are our current concerns, yes. which we'd like to see uh, answered okay. in the future. Our current concerns are at this point in time that the way the legislation is interpreted in Scotland is different to that in England. We don't have a, an issue regarding SEPA's interpretation. Is that, is that, that difference I'm seeking? Yeah. We don't have a, we don't have a concern because uh, we, we believe that SEPA are interpreting, interpreting in no different a way than they should. Our problem is the interpretation that the English authorities have on the same piece of legislation, which is an advantage to our competitors mm -hmm. and creates an unlevel playing field. So that's our current concern. 
How to, how to resolve that would be difficult under no, normal circumstances, but because of this, uh, this new change in legislation that's coming about over the next period of time, then that's where we would like to have the assistance of the Scottish Government to be able to ensure that when the, the breath notes are set for the industry going forward, it's done on a uniform basis across the whole of the United Kingdom. Right. Okay. Does that help? Um, well, I think it, it, it helps in the sense that I'm willing to have another look at it, Chair, because I haven't quite understand, un understood the 100 percent argument, but nevertheless, there is a concern, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for the fact that you have a concern and you brought it to our attention. I'm, I'm willing to have a look at it again, Chair. Okay. Any further questions? Right. Could I ask the committee then what action it would be prepared to take on this petition? Um, David? Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to continue. Can we write to um, SEPA asking them on their views and the Scottish Government so we could continue the petition? Members agreed? Okay. John? Convener, could I, could I also suggest we write to DEFRA? Uh, because clearly the local authorities in England and Wales aren't operating under guidance that they have developed. It's been, guidance has been issued by DEFRA. And it would be useful to find out from DEFRA why the interpretation of the same regulation from Europe has been applied differently in Scotland as it is in England and Wales. So I, I think it might be useful to actually write to DEFRA and seek clarification on how they uh, came about interpreting the rules differently from uh, SEPA. Angus? Yeah, I'm just wondering if it might be um, advisable at, at, at the present moment to also write to the Environment Minister um, just to make her aware of the, 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 the situation uh, that, um, that uh, Dundas Chemical Company find themselves in. Um, clearly, uh, any input at that level would be helpful. So, in summing up, then, does the committee then agree that we will write to SEPA, DEFRA, and the Environmental Minister, and possibly to complete the circle? Could you perhaps forward to the committee any information you receive from Alan Smith? Thank you. Can I thank Councillor Wood, uh, Dr. McLeod, and Mr. Watt for their attendance? I will now postpone for a couple of minutes to change over. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, the, next, the next new petition is P1558 by John Tom on behalf of the RNBCC Crayfish Committee. Can the catchment on American signal, signal crayfish? Uh, we'll now offer you the opportunity, Mr. Tom, to give a short presentation to the committee and then thereafter we'll answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, as James, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for letting me get this far with what we've managed to do. Um, we're a small little organisation. We haven't got any financial backing, really, from anyone, and we're using SEPA's and Scottish National Heritage's reports and our own reports here to contradict to, and to try and get a change in the law, which at the moment stands only scientific trapping may be continued or considered. In that situation, Scottish National Heritage and SEPA do not have the finances to carry out a large trapping experiment. It is totally out of their budget. So what we're suggesting is that a change in the law be carried out so that commercial industries can come in working along with Scottish National Heritage and SEPA to carry out a large trapping scale programme, as in the Galway Fisheries Trust report of 2009, carrying out a four-month experiment, 
which was to carry out and find out which method was the best in actually trapping the crayfish. This came to the conclusion that a three-year trapping programme should be started immediately, but was turned down due to not being financially economical, due to the restrictions of finance on these two agencies. We've also got the reports here from the National Research Council of a 10-year trapping programme which was carried out from 2001 to 2009 and 10, stating that the biosphere and environmental crustaceans of the rivers trapping over that long period increased and the numbers of crayfish did decrease and that having the juveniles being left in the water, which is not part of our plan, did become did breed earlier, but most of the eggs were actually infertile. That they're reducing the actual numbers of population. And there is more research needed and required into that. That's from the West report on the Lake Lanark. We've also got the other reports here that actually support my major long-term trapping. And also, with the crayfish population increasing, it causes the algae blooms in the lochs and rivers. And now that they're in the tributaries of the River Tay, the Tweed, and the rest, it won't be long until they move down into the actual Tweed itself and ruining the salmon fishing in these areas as well. The whole biosphere and catchment areas here in Loch Ken is costing, after the survey carried out on the 19th by one of our other members, is £533,000, £500 per annum. That is not including the loss from Scottish Power's generation and the new flood bankings that have to be prepared every year and the loss of land, which is approximately eight and a half acres at the moment along the side of the loch, which at £500 an acre is quite a substantial bit of money and lost to farmers. That's really all I've got to do at the moment. Thank you, Mr Tom. Uh, I'm now open it to questions. Angus? Yeah, well, thanks, Convener. Just for clarification, um, in what way are, are Scottish Power uh, affected by this? What, what, what damage is caused there? Well, when the, flood, the crayfish burrow into the bankings of approximately a metre deep, and due to the generation and the flood tide and that coming in, well, going down the river, with the burrowing into the bankings, this causes bank, the bankings to collapse, the trees then to come in, which okay. builds up at the bridges which then floods the farmer's land, so they have to cease the generation right. to alleviate the floods, which is a lot of money, and it's been economically, the environment of being being hydroelectric. Mm. And that was something else we forgot to remember. The byproducts of the trapping programme, the shells can actually be used as a non-chemical slug repellent, which then saves for hedgehogs in certain areas, so I forgot to mention that then. So. Right, <laughs> Ticks a lot of boxes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As it happens, um, I happened to see a Reporting Scotland feature last week, I think, when they were showing us these uh, crayfish, and they seem to be extraordinarily invasive, a very successful species, incredibly resilient, and altogether quite tasty as well, as, uh, by all accounts. Um, it's how you deal with it. Now, Scottish uh, National Heritage, in their response to the petition, um, are very aggressively of the view that the licensing of, the, uh, of this commercially would act as a, an incentive for their illegal introduction into all other waterways around Scotland because people would then see that they could be licensed to fish the product there and make a nice return from it so that in fact licensing would act as a catalyst for the extension of the invasive species rather than uh, as uh, a method of containment. Uh, and I, I'm interested in your reaction to that. I have to say I'm slightly, I'm not advocating it because I'm slightly then unimpressed by Scottish National Heritage's argument because Ultimately, it seems to me that they say that the only way to stop this is to fall back on what I think the least successful uh, policy option in almost any instance in political life that I can remember it being urged upon, which is to educate people of, and raise awareness, which hasn't worked in alcohol, hasn't worked in seat belts, didn't work in tobacco, and I can't think of any instance when raising public awareness is of the slightest effect at all. So if that's all Scottish National Heritage can say by way of a remedy, I'm not terribly impressed. But I would like to understand your reaction to their fear about what licensing might do. 
Well, we actually come around that problem by making it, if we are licensed, uh, is to work with Scottish National Heritage and SEPA, and it wouldn't be a general overall licensing. It was to allow funding to be t brought in on a scientific method with SEPA and SNH with a commercial company on a non-profit basis. So the profits that were made covering expenses would then be ploughed back into the teaching and scientific side of the students going through Glasgow University to learn more about biodiversity. This way, any landowner thinking about, or any other business thinking about interfering and putting them somewhere else, would not be able to make any, any profit, so there would be no incentive for them to do this, as it would be a non, have to be a non-profit commercial venture, whereas the, the profits would be so, taken in by the teaching of students and covering the costs of that job. Right, so you would see a very specific restriction on the commercial exploitation of a profit by it simply being an operation that effectively allowed a business to operate, but for those profits then to be reinvested into education and community benefit of some yes. sort. Yes, so that there was no actual... The, the business that came in... Yeah, would I, mean, I, mean, to... right. I mean, because it's certainly, I think, Scottish National Heritage's response to the proposal is predicated on the basis that the only way in which a licence would operate would be on the basis that somebody was then going to be able to commercially sell the product uh, all over the place uh, for a private gain. And, and you're challenging that as being what a licensing need yes. inevitably lead to. Yes. But okay. as, as I've stated in my other one there, it's no private company is going to come in and throw millions of pounds or thousands of pounds at a project without actually covering their costs. Whereas we have had been asked and approached by a company in Lanark right. and three in England and, and the, from China and, and Norway to come in and actually do this trapping as long as they can receive the product and they will cover the costs, okay. which would approximately, according to the figures, employ 50 people directly in the actual trapping in that, and not including the students coming in. And that then would build into about 130 full-time jobs in the hotel and trade industry with the increase in, increase in tourism and that, again, that has been lost, as commented in SEPA and SNH reports, the economic impact in the area. And not with, to the final point, notwithstanding the, the current regulations, I'm told that were I to visit friends in the area, I might find one or two of these crayfish had found their way into the kitchen. Is that, is that yes. something you care to come into? <laughs> well, the, the problem is at the moment, being, um, I'll, I'll say non-existent, <laughs> As, as in on teaching the public, there is, in the 13-mile length of the loch, there is six signs on an A4 sheet of paper saying, please do not trap, as these are, a non -invasive, these are an invasive species, do not take them away. Uh, and a five-minute news broadcast does not actually, I think, can constitute a campaign of education to the public. Uh, by no means does it stretch that far. Right. So... For them to turn around and say they're having a public educational programme is not... Oh, sorry, and one meeting in the Cross Keys Hotel. We did have that for ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? John? Yeah, just to try and draw out from Mr Tom the issue about... He's mentioned students uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, how would you see the tie-in with the academic world in relation to any... Uh, commercialisation of the trapping methods used, and how would that tie in with uh, academia? At the moment, well, students from Glasgow University comes down and traps the loch and doing studies. Now, the, as I was state list here, now we've got the biosphere of the loch is in such a state that it doesn't actually exist anymore in some parts as it's been destroyed. These students then, with the large trapping programme, involved can actually monitor and do their own scientific studies on how the environment improves and this then give them the practical experience instead of just theory sitting in the classroom and writing the same reports each time and oh it's getting worse it's getting worse it's getting worse that's what's happening they can actually then sit back and actually instead of having the same report coming in with the same students every year and from the same findings they can actually show that then the increase of the lily beds, the crustaceans and everything else in the natural biosphere of the loch returning and this year improving the scale so it gives a total different and the tutors a chance to read something fresh instead of going yes that's ok it matches up with the same reports we had last year on the, but it's actually we have given them practical experience in the trapping methods 
instead of just reading reports and paperwork and clarifying. Convener, I'm like Jackson Carlo, I'm rather concerned at the SEPA SNH response to this petition because mm. if, what effectively they're saying is uh, we don't have the money to do anything in terms of large scale trapping, but therefore we're not going to do anything about it. But at the same time, we're actually seeing the increase of a non native invasive species mm. uh, in terms of population growing, and not only growing, but spreading throughout other uh, tributaries and lochs in Scotland. The, the issue for me would be whether or not there would be an issue in relation to, you mentioned uh, Scottish power and the, the damage that's the, in terms of the banks that are being do, done to the floodplains and the logs. Has there been any discussions with Scottish power in, to get Scottish power to try and invest in some protection methods to ensure uh, that they could actually provide some support? Uh, financial support that would be to ensure that they could actually either control or eradicate uh, the signal crayfish population in the loch? They are supplying at the moment the Loch Kane Management Committee, who runs the ranger on the loch, a few thousand pounds at the moment per annum. But that goes in with the support into his wages to monitor the boats and that on the right. loch, not into, not into the, because at the moment they can't get involved in it because it's not a commercial product. And as it's, it's not commercial, and they're a commercial company, and after having tried for the last six years to find a backer that would come in and finance and support, we even su approached the RSPB and the Hedgehog Charity Society to see if we could <coughs> get the meat products and that, that would be produced and sell them to them at a cost price. But this then was knocked back by SNH, I mean, in Glasgow, as that then would put a commercial value on the crayfish which everyone knows there is a commercial value on. So, as they're sold in Aldi's, Tesco's, you know, we're all in, we're important at the moment, eight and a half tonnes per week into Scotland from abroad, which is quite a substantial loss in industry here in Scotland. And if we are, as a nation, or the whole UK or just Scotland, if it does go independent, the only way the country will survive is by business and export. And this is the whole thing I'm looking at it is it's not just a rural community thing, it's the whole country that's getting involved in this. And at the last count, there's been 47 different areas confirmed with, invest, with invasive species in it. And thank it's just going to hit the whole economy of the country. Right, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, in your petition, uh, Mr Tom, you are, you are asking for the, the licence to be changed. And uh, if that does not happen, what do you, you know, what's the foreseeable future then for the... Uh, we, we can basically write off Scotland as a salmon fisheries place or the extreme cost it's going to cost the regional and local authorities with the local flooding and ditches and that collapsing in and the whole environment change. We'll lose our dragonflies, our great crested newts, the whole frog system, spawning areas. And that, this is what the crayfish eat, the lily pads. They're, all, they're, they're really just like, I don't know if you've ever seen the nature programmes of a locust Swarm going into a cornfield. That is what crayfish are like. They just devastate everything, and you're left with a muddy pond. It is not a pretty sight. It's not very nice. <laughs> there is, sorry. And one, one final question from me is that you said that SEPA uh, doesn't have the finance to support this. Uh, have they gave you any particular reason it's because they don't have the finance or they don't see this as being a a priority for them to invest on? It's, I'll if you give me two seconds, I'll quote from the letter that I've got here from SNH and SEPA. I'll just get the right specs on here. Sorry for this, I can't wear bifocals as I try and walk in the carpets and it's, <laughs> uh, you know. Yep, it's, uh, no, that's the wrong one. Yeah, it's really down to financial. They do not have the financial backing of that or resources. Did they put any figure on that? No, they didn't. They did put a figure on it? No, but uh, okay. if the cost, a rough estimate from when I phoned the Tay Fishery Board, what it cost up at Abington, I don't know if you know where Abington is, ladies and gentlemen, it's up, was it with, three, with six water pumps and closing off a piece of stream for three weeks, was in the region of £60,000. 
So to actually, and that was just a three weeks eradication for a couple hundred metres of. So you're talking large, large sums that are not sustainable to these agencies. They would bankrupt them in two minutes and cost the taxpayer and the government a lot of money. <laughs> okay. Any further questions? Angus? Yeah, just one point, convener. Um, you've, Mr. Tom, you've mentioned um, that there may be a significant environmental impact, uh, and you mentioned uh, salmon uh, fishing as well. Uh, and your, your, um, your submission actually goes further. It says other costs include the destruction of salmon, sea trout, and brown trout spawning beds, the loss of river walks, farmland, dragonflies, nesting areas, wildfowl, and the complete destruction of the marine biosphere in the affected area. You, that, that's not that's over dramatising the situation. No, that's it's actually SNH and SEPA's own reports are saying that. Okay. <laughs> so okay, I'm thanks. actually taking using their reports and the National Research Council and the Galway Fishers Trust and Marine Environmental Forest, Forestry Directive and Lake Tahoe Lake and reports. They're all scientific reports I'm getting all my information from. Okay, and you mentioned also that there's 47 areas confirmed with uh, American signal crayfish. Yes, there is. That's um, not including the ones that haven't actually been confirmed as yet which is there is a few in the pipeline. Okay, I don't, we don't have that uh, list, I don't think. It would be good to get hold of it, can we now, I think? It's easy enough to find, so you can go on the internet and it all goes on the SNH and SEPA's site where they're all contaminated in different reports that have come in from these. So that's where I've got my, all my information from is carrying on through in different meetings from SNH and SEPA. Okay, thanks. <laughs> is there any further questions from the committee? Can I then ask the committee what action it decides to take on this petition? David. Convener, I definitely think this is the remit of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. I would like it to pass it on to them to take on board. Jackson. Actually, I disagree. I, 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 this seems to me precisely the sort of petition that the Petitions Committee could do something useful with. It does seem to me that there is a recognised problem which has somehow managed to stay underneath the uh, searchlight of focused uh, political uh, intervention, which we might be able to give some assistance to. It may ultimately be that it's referred, but in the first instance, I think I would like to hear the Scottish Government's views, because they do seem to have been involved, and I'd like to understand where they think the whole thing has got to, but I'd be very much in favour then of taking evidence from uh, Scottish National Heritage and SEPA uh, on the issue, uh, and if, if there is some viability in a not-for-profit uh, enterprise, as has been suggested, to take <laughs> the work to a certain stage and then potentially, at that stage, potentially give it over to the Rural Affairs and Climate Change Committee with some suggestion as to how we might move forward. Because it does seem to me at the moment that it's been something of a, an unproductive circle of recognition of the issue, but a disinclination to actually agree on any solution and in the absence of anybody making a fuss about that, nothing happening. Angus? Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I would agree with uh, Jackson Carroll. I can see uh, where David Torrance is coming from with regard to uh, referring it to the Rural Affairs Committee, uh, particularly given that that committee is currently uh, looking at the Wild Fisheries Review Group's report. Um, however, uh, I agree with Mr Carroll that... Um, uh, we should seek the Scottish Government's views first and foremost um, prior to deciding what next course of, course of action the Petitions Committee should take. Um, so, happy to go with that uh, recommendation from Mr Carroll. I'm happy to go along with the recommendations. Good. Convener, could I ask Mr Carroll if he would include in the evidence session, because he mentioned SNH and SEPA coming to give evidence to the committee, whether he would consider the minister uh, yeah. be invited at that same session to give evidence as well? Well, I, I, I actually, Angus MacDonald, I think I'm probably in agreement here. I'd like to hear the Scottish Government's view first. I don't preclude evidence thereafter. I'm not necessarily saying I would go that route, but I can see that I might. And yes, in those circumstances, I'd be quite happy to hear from the minister then too. But I think the first instance, since the Scottish Government obviously has some understanding of the issue, I'd quite like to get to grips with what they think their understanding of it is. 
committed and agreed to the right to the Scottish Government. I think it's a good petition. Yep. Very good. I'm just sorry you didn't bring any of them with you for us to have a... Yeah. <laughs> I've imported them. We brought them here already dead. <laughs> and we could have had a... Excuse me, we were actually nice with garlic and a little bit of thyme. Oh, and salad. And white sauce. I'm just wondering whether there's any uh, advising the Rules Committee as well of what's been in front of us. Just for information at this stage only, I don't think it would, it would go amiss. Uh, they may, in fact, want to add to any uh, evidence themselves um, or not. Yeah. I think probably in the first instance, why don't we write to the Scottish Government asking for their, their views and then we'll take it from okay. here. Okay. okay. Can we yeah. uh, Angus. As a member of the Rural Affairs Committee, I'm happy to, to informally bring it back okay. to, uh, <laughs> to, to the committee. Good. Thank you. <laughs> right, okay then. Good man. <laughs> And Mr. Tomkin, I thank you for attending. I will now suspend for a couple of minutes for a changeover. Thank you very much. Okay, the uh, third petition today is PE 1557 by David R. Slater on behalf of Save Our White Sands Car Parks and River Views on Scottish Government funding for White Sands Flood Scheme. Members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing of the petition. And may I welcome petitioner uh, David Slater to the meeting and uh, I also welcome his colleague John Dowson. Uh, Mr. Slater, I will invite you to speak around five minutes to your petition and thereafter we'll move on to questions. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all very much for inviting me here today, along with my colleague, Mr Dowson. Uh, this is a very emotive subject, I must admit, for the town of Dumfries, but I'll give you the reasons why. Uh, Dumfries and Galway Council have proposed a flood prevention scheme for the White Sands area of Dumfries. The Council have stated the start of the construction works will be dependent on funding being available from the Scottish Government. I am calling on the Scottish Government to rule out providing specific funding for this project for the following reasons. Local opposition. The strength of feeling from so many people prompted me to raise a petition against the flood defence system proposed by Dumfries and Galloway Council. The petition has gone from strength to strength and now has, uh, has 4,000 signatures. The opposition comes from local businesses and the general public, including visitors to Dumfries. The main uh, people don't want to lose the river view and their important safe car parking within easy reach of the main post office, banks and many local businesses. The people fear the time this is going to take to build approximately two years. No one wants to see the bus route altered to make the buses go up a narrow street where there are many, many pedestrians. The costs, the council said the costs would be £12 million. In just a few short weeks has increased to £15 million and rising. I have researched other flood defence companies with designs that would keep our river views and important safe car parks at a much lower cost and build times. Have the Council considered or spoken with any other flood defence companies as the only one petition on the table for councils to consider? Why is this? Oh, sorry. I invited the CEO of another flood defence company to come to a public meeting in the Fries to demonstrate their designs and products and show the people how they could build flood defences at a considerably less cost and build time and save our car parks and river views. Over 150 people attended my public meeting. The council are having to buy a private car park. 
with money from the public purse to try and find room for 230 cars that will be displaced if this scheme goes ahead. A car park is normally full most days already. This is my previous actions. I have written to Scotland's First Minister and Environment Minister, asked questions at the Minister's question time at Easterbrook Hall and the priests after, after the recent Government Cabinet meeting. The Environment Minister, Dr Aileen MacLeod, informed me at the meeting she would be looking into the proposed flood prevention scheme and may visit the town of Cockermouth to view their flood protection, including the floating wall. I had meetings and dialogue with council officials. I have raised the issue with, in the media about this flood project that started at £12 million, and now in just a few short weeks, now £15 million. I have spoken with several councillors about this proposed flood prevention scheme as well. The photos and design plans the Council put out to the public do not show the true image of the finished project, in particular the height of the proposed grass blanket that will block our river views. It will destroy our river views, views of our river forever. And part of the build will have walls around two metres high with glass panels on the top. The walkway on top of these earth bankings does not show that any safety railings on the top of it as an incline of 30 to 35 degrees of around 8 metres of grass to the base of it. The river from the road will be blocked off from public view. What is, if something happens beside the river, someone falling or worse, at the moment there is a clear view of the river from the roadway and the shop's, shop's side. Have the emergency services been spoken to as regards access to the river, if any incident occurs, and that includes inshore rescue? The buses will have to go up Bank Street where there is a sharp right turn and is a busy area for people walking. The buses then face a multi-road system that does create traffic jams. The loss of our public toilets with no decision by council if they will be rebuilt and where. The build time for this project in excess of two years and will turn a river front into a building site and what happens if a river floods in, in that time scale. Most businesses inform me that they are very concerned about this project, especially in these times of austerity. The cost project is rising, or I said the cost is 12 to 15 million. The Council want to turn a green area into a riverside car park to help find space for 230 proposed displaced parking spaces. This proposed green area is further out of and has very difficult access in and out. And our ancient Rood Fair that comes to our town twice a year will be lost forever. And it's been coming here for, uh, I think it's seven generations at least. Sorry. Has the Council engaged properly with the public about the proposed flood prevention scheme, as some of the information they are using appears to have been collated in 2013? If the Council are democratic, why are they continuing to push a flood scheme through a system, through the system that thousands of people don't want and they, and they won't even basically speak to us. I feel as many do, this is not the way to treat the people who with a hard-earned money pay for these, these projects and their salaries through the public purse. They are coming across as being driven by ego to push this poor thought-out design through the system and have it built in our town. The people fear another DG1 scenario at the name of our flagship leisure centre that cost at least £17 million and just a few years has been plagued with faults and now so bad it's closed, apparently until the end of 2016 and possibly beyond. To be perfectly honest, people would rather have nothing rather than this ill-conceived and poorly thought out design thrust upon them in their ancient market town. I'm just going to think of the please. All the bushes and flowers on their design on their steep earth and bankings, when flooding comes, they will pick up all the debris and contaminants. Also, it will be trapped between the railings and the grass bund. Who will be cleaning this, as council don't clean, clean it already? Earth bunds are for the country, not in the centre of towns, especially the town of Dumfries. It says, I have campaigned for years to have flood defences, but certainly not this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Slater. Questions? David? Thank you, Convener. Um, as somebody who was a local councillor before an NSP, is this still going through the consultation process with your council, and is it still going through the planning process? Well, they say they're still looking at it, but what happened was 
Last November, what, uh, November was it December? Was it John? December. Right. December. Yeah, December. Last December, I think it was the 14th. My my campaign was gathering pace, and they had a large meeting in <coughs> St George Street Hall, where around about approximately 100 people turned up. But they, and they presented a, a PowerPoint presentation at the end of it. Uh, the company that built the Cockermouth Float and Wall Scheme, they, they kind of we say, said it wouldn't work in Dumfries, it was too costly for Dumfries, and uh, it couldn't cope with the drainage. But uh, Mr Kelly, who owns this worldwide company, uh, UK Flood Barriers, uh, he came to, I invited him to Dumfries, and he brought his systems to Dumfries, his ability systems worldwide, and he also wrote to the council and refuted uh, what they'd actually said at that meeting. And since then, our, I have some photographs here I can leave you. Obviously, you haven't time to look at today. I can show you the car park, and this is obviously a, a mock-up of what they intend to build. But now, yes, they're saying that they're still looking at it, and they said they've engaged with UK flood barriers, but only on the morning that Mr Kelly came here to do the meeting. Before that, there was no real contact for at least two years. Um, Mr Slater, you says in your evidence there they had only talked to one company, but surely as a council under European law, when a project this size is of a certain, they've got to put out to tender to well, different companies and different designs. What I've actually done, sir, I, I've actually uh, I asked for a Freedom of Information Act for the council to produce all that evidence back to me. I've done that just a few days ago, and hopefully I believe that they have 20 days to respond to it. 28, I think it is. Well, I actually gave them 28, but they came back and said they could do it in 20. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll live with that. But once the final plans are drawn and are passed by council, that has got to go out to tender. It has to. Well, I must admit, I wish if the council actually spoke to us, like they, they spoke to the people in Penrith, where they sat down round the table with the environment <coughs> agency, the, the, the local people and the local council, eventually all these things were actually put together. And I think the total cost of the one at Penrith was 4.4 million, with the government uh, uh, paying, the environment agency, sorry, paying uh, just over 3 million of it. The council paid just over a million. And I think that 400 and something thousand was raised by public donations. So I have to say the scheme here, Mr Kelly said he could probably do it for half the price and keep our river views and they are, are very, very important car parks. The council want to move the cars off the white sands. But to be perfectly honest with you, this is a hub of our town. This is the safest place in our town to park our cars. There's not a safer place. The police will actually tell you that. It's very, very open. It's very good. It could do with a massive tidy up. I grant you that, which I, I, I can leave these photographs to show you. But I think that they're going down the road, road, wrong road with this design. Uh, most big towns open the river up nowadays, people to see it. If you have a river in a town, it's, uh, it's just good to have that. Most big towns would love a river. We have one but we're not uh, you know, looking after it, and we've also got to box it in by 3.5 metre walls, and I think that's not acceptable. Can I ask, Mr Slater, um, what the environmental impact would go be if the uh, defences didn't go ahead? And I'll give you an example. Um, I represent the Cody constituency. We've just had to spend £11.5 million building a new seawall. Beautiful views, but we had to raise it so high to protect all the houses behind it. Um, and the community accepted it, because the defences were in place to protect their high street and the house in there. Well, can I say, the, the, this wall system, I've studied it for some time now, and they built uh, part of it in Cockermouth. This wall actually uses river water. It's a bit like Jekyll and Hyde, I suppose. The river tries to flood the town, but the, the wall, the river also lifts the wall as well, and it can lift it, and the highest it can lift it at the moment. Uh, it depends on the area, what the river levels are, but it can lift as much as 2.5 metres. They're built over the world. This company covers the Washington Museum. It covers Dunray Nuclear Reactor Station and many, many, just a, a zoo in Malaysia recently. And they're actually looking at Stonehaven, uh, Stonehouse, is it in Aberdeenshire? There's a big project there come, possibly being looked at. And in some of the design, that wall system appears that it may be, be used. Because what it does in Cockermouth, the houses are only from here 
first of here to the, the river. And when that wall was built, it never disturbed the houses. So the build time is much, much less. It's less disruption. And the views are left to the people. And when the river rises, in actual fact, the houses are starting to sell next to the river now. So that's a regeneration process is certainly working. And believe it or not, uh, many people have been to view this wall because it's very unique. Uh, and it's become a little bit of a tourist attraction, believe it or not. So as regards to rege regeneration, I think it would possibly help the place as well as people would come to view it. No further questions, Could I maybe um, yeah, you just add a little yeah. bit, a, a wee bit of context about the actual flooding in the freeze is that it tends to only happen for about two or three days a year on, on the high tide. And most times it's actually quite a modest level. Um, I think, you know, it's about once in every 30 years that you really get a, 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 big, a big flood. The problem with the, the current proposal from the council is they're proposing a 365-day barrier for a flood that only comes for probably about 48 hours a year. Um, whereas the, the solution that David's talking about, because it reacts to the river, only comes up for that critical 48-hour period time and disappears. Um, the council have consulted in but partly in terms of your previous um, question, but the consultations so far are, are really split in the community. Um, and what we're finding is that more and more people um, are signing the petition against the, the current proposal. Uh, the council have indicated that they cannot carry out their proposal without funding from yourselves, from the Scottish Government. They're looking for 80% of, say, 15, 16 million um, you know, we're well over £10 million they'll be looking for um, from the Scottish Government. So this petition is really asking you, asking the government not to fund that particular scheme. We're quite happy to look at alternatives. That, 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 that there are some there. But I think it's important to put it in that context. We believe that, I, I'm a previous councillor of um, Dumfries and Galloway Council. In fact, I, I led the council for four years up till 1999. And during that period, um, we had a number of schemes brought forward about flood prevention, all of which were rejected. Um, what we feel has happened here is that the Council has appointed Gillespie's consultants who are largely known for landscaping, or as landscaping consultants. And what we do not need in Dumfries is a landscaping solution. Uh, we need an engineering solution. Um, and I think that that's where part of the problem has occurred. Uh, so we're just urging uh, Scottish Government on this occasion um, not we're trying to save you money isn't that marvellous <laughs> um, no we, we think it's right and proper that Scottish Government has created a flood prevention fund for Scotland but I'd have to say uh, my limited knowledge of other areas of Scotland would suggest um, that there are other areas of Scotland that would merit um, this money uh, far, far more than Dumfries I think probably, I mean, today, I mean, your, your, your issue is really a local issue, and I think probably where you need to be is having your local representatives sitting down round about the table, because I'm looking at the petition, and you're, you're absolutely right. It's gathering, you know, signatures day after day after day. But I'm also looking at the evidence here saying that the, that the local council has actually out and done a consultation, you know, with a number of people, and that's why they've actually come up with this new vision. You know, to protect the, the, you know, the, the area. Uh, so I think probably from our point of view, we would encourage everybody, you need to get back around about the table for, you know, to have this dialogue discussion how best you're going to go forward. But we'll make a decision, uh, you know, when we're finished the, the, the question. But one thing I would also like to point out to you is that I've been advised that the uh, Dumfries and Galloway, the White Sands project, has been one of the unsuccessful applications. Uh, this year, uh, 15 and 16, and uh, that was in a question by Sarah Boy Boyack and answered by Paul Wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the so the funding for for White Sands in year 15 and 16 has been unsuccessful. And that was a question. Sorry, that was a question last last May. That was a question right. last time. Yeah. Yes, I have to say, I believe that they, fund, they did put in funding request. Sorry, Chair. They did put a funding request in, but it was flawed, apparently, 
because I wrote to Paul Wheelhouse and uh, I think the time was running out and by the time they put it in it was still flawed and it was, uh, that's probably the reason it's been rejected. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The White Sands, the, the, the White Sands appeal project is actually is, is further to an ongoing appeal and uh, so that, that has still been discussed. Is there any further questions? Uh, could I maybe ask the committee what their course of action would be in this petition? for a more detailed view. I mean, presumably, they didn't arrive at a scheme to cope with flood prevention just because they thought it was a lovely idea. There must have been something a little bit more fundamental underpinning that investigation. Um, and I think I would like to know what that was and have a broader understanding, because I imagine... There will be lots of people saying it's not an issue, but it may very well be a very considerable issue for some. And, and therefore, I think I would like to just have a, the Council's perspective on all of that and then maybe have from uh, ask them also why it was they did alight on this particular solution of the ones they considered. Uh, and if, in fact, they haven't been successful funding what they think their likely course of action now might be. Mm -hmm. David? Um, I'm happy to agree with Jackson. Um, that would write to Council, get information from him, but I feel this is a real local issue. That there's still dialogue out there needs to be taken ahead with the local community out there, um, engage with the local community and the Council, um, sit around the table, because from what I can see, the plans aren't finalised yet either. They've not been passed through full Council. Um, so dialogue is important and maybe we could uh, resolve this by doing that um. happy um, to have um, more meaningful dialogue uh, with the council um, I've reminded them of the your own document about the principles of community engagement where there are ten um, guidelines that councils or authorities should follow um, it's our feeling then Dumfries and Gallimick uh, that they have not followed that properly although they've had some consultation meetings they have pushed one scheme, um, you know, at the exclusion of all the other options. Mm -hmm. And people like myself and David Slater, when we make representations, are simply rebuffed. In fact, they won't even uh, speak to us. They don't want to talk to us now. Um, and I think uh, any pressure that can be brought by yourselves to require the council um, to meet those principles or those guidelines of community engagement in the locality, we'd be very grateful for I think it's also important that, 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 that you must involve your local representatives, representatives in this. Yes. You must get them to be chapping down the, you know, the plan department's doors saying that you wish to be, be consulting with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think, as John says, I must admit that we haven't had the, no dialogue really with us, and yet our campaign is a reasonable size. And I believe if the campaign hadn't been started... I believe it would, it would still be pushed on to this particular design, which I think is uh, business people and everybody who walks alive, visitors and that, cannot believe that they want to build something like that, but you can't see a river. I'll leave these with you. You can obviously look yeah. at them. I, I think it, it, the white sands is a very important area. It feeds two main, it feeds <coughs> the, the Friars Venal and it feeds Bank Street, where people stop there. And they're talking about taking lines off the street to create more parking. But to be perfectly honest with you, uh, the office probably needs more parking, but not to move the parking. That's what's really, really an issue here. But when you're driving up the street, you see a well, space. We've, uh, we've agreed, Mr. Slater, we'll write to the, the local government. Uh, thank the local you very much. Council so. and the local council yes. here. Uh, so can I thank Mr Slater and Mr Dowson for attending. That concludes the formal business of the committee today and can I on behalf of the committee uh, thank everybody in Dumfries. It's been a, an extreme pleasure being here today and uh, the committee intends to now stay for at least another half an hour so those members of the public who would like to stay behind for a Q&A please feel free to do so and I now formally close the meeting. Thank you.